Good afternoon, church. Uh, welcome to our online English ministry service at London Chinese Lions Church. Uh, we're glad you could uh, come and join us today. Uh, do feel free to use the comments on the side and say hi to each other. Let us know how you've been getting on and just encourage each other and share prayer requests if you have them. So uh, I invite you now. Uh, let's prepare our hearts uh, for the service. Let's be present. Let's engage and let's worship God together. I'll turn the time now to Sijun. Thanks, Brad. Uh, welcome, everyone. Welcome to church. Um, again, this is a an online service, and uh, we've had this for a few weeks now. So hopefully, everyone is a bit more used to this setup. Um, but yeah, let let's all join together, even though we are physically apart, and uh, let's bring our praises to God, and uh, let's. Uh, do that by singing some songs and um, yeah just take this time to prepare your hearts and to just really bring your worship Blessed be your name. 
Cause every blessing you pour out I'll turn back to praise When the darkness closes in Lord, Still I will say Blessed be the name of the Lord Blessed be your name Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name.
Lord, we need you, our living hope. Because there's nothing that we can do to make our own way to you. That our sin and our transgressions against you, there's nothing we can do, there's nothing we can say to take those away. But Lord, in your mercy, in your power, you gave up your life in our place. So that we are forgiven. So that we are the sons and daughters of the Almighty God. So that we are free from the shackles of sin and the wages of sin is death. So in this time of trouble, in this time of isolation, Lord, may we hold on to you. May we be encouraged that because of the great love you have shown us on the cross, because of your great power, that these things that we face now are insignificant. And Lord, even though right now we seem, we might feel like we seem we're in a place of difficulty, Lord, let us know that you have conquered it all. That even death itself cannot face up to you. Let us rise as one church. Let us be a shining light in this time for the people around us. And whether it's through our keeping in touch with each other through the internet, or whatever posts we make on social media, whatever people can see of us right now, let us shine the light of Christ into this world.
So let us join with heaven now and proclaim the glory of our Lord. And let us take courage in his resurrection and in his power. Yeah. 
I gladly bow the knee and worship him alone. Yes, Lord, you are forever on the throne. So let us place our trust in you alone, in the almighty living God. So Lord, equip us this day. May our ears be attentive to you. May our hearts be open to you. May our eyes be able to see the wisdom that you will be presenting us. Lord, speak to us. We are here. So you are God. Praise and glory belongs to you. So fill us with your spirit now as one church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'll uh, pass this time back to Brad now, uh, who will be going through the announcements. Thank you, Sijun. Uh, just uh, a couple of quick announcements. Um, do continue uh, praying for those of us uh, those, uh, that you know are ill. Um, Pastor Gus and Annie continue praying for them in their recovery. And we do praise God uh, for uh, Jane Ho's healing. Um, but do continue pray for, praying for Stephen for uh, a, a quick and full recovery. Um, please also note next Sunday, we will be celebrating communion. So. Uh, do please have something prepared to symbolize the bread and the cup, and we will be taking communion together. And uh, yeah, that's all for the announcement. So today uh, we have a guest speaker with us uh, who needs very little introduction. Um, he streams all the way from Milton Keynes. Uh, so we welcome Josh Sheck uh, in our midst uh, in our service today. So I'm just going to pray for him first, and then I'll pass the time over to Josh. Please join me in prayer. Father, we thank you uh, for the opportunity for Josh to come share with us. We just pray, Lord, that your uh, spirit of anointing would be upon him and that you would uh, speak to him, speak through him, allow our ears to be attentive to what you want to say through him. So, Lord, we thank you for your servant here and um, just bless him as he blesses us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good afternoon, everyone. It's so good uh, to be here with all of you guys. Um, yes, as Brad said, I'm actually uh, calling in from Milton Keynes. Uh, so there's no need for me to have to drive down to you guys today. Um, but otherwise, it's still so good to be able to be here with you virtually. I hope you are well and healthy and you're with uh, family uh, right now, uh, wherever you are. Um, I don't know how you've cut the lockdown, but for me, it's been, I don't know, for me, it's actually been quite a, uh, uh, because in, in some ways, a, a fun and interesting experience. I, I, li I live by myself, so the past four weeks, I've just been by myself um, at home. I'm dialing into you now uh, from uh, my, my study, and, and this has become my studio um, of sorts now, just like visiting lots of different churches and different places uh, through the power of technology, which is wonderful. I think it's really good that we live in an age where um, even in difficult times like these, we can still communicate with each other. We can still enjoy these united spiritual experiences with each other um, online. Um, and it's been weird. It's been a, been a very, very, for some perhaps a, 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 an enjoyable time of rest and relaxation. 
for others though I realize it may be a quite a difficult time of having to work out how do we do things about food how do we um now kind of like readjust our our our, our, our dynamics as a family or as flatmates as we love each other um and i guess now that we're kind of here a month in um most of us i think are probably kind of settled down we've kind of like gone into a rhythm of where we are, all are right now and um things are starting to get this a whole new kind of groove we kind of found a new way of settling into a rhythm of lockdown life um at this point um and it's kind of what i want to share about um today uh so before um i start uh we, we look, look at the word um shall we just pray once more and um, before we um go into uh, the sermon today let's pray father god we thank you for uh, this opportunity uh, this rare time in our week when we get to connect with other people in a way that is beyond just doing business it is beyond just playing online games with each other god we thank you for this opportunity right now where we get to engage with each other spiritually because it is the one spirit that draws us all close together in your temple right now. We thank you that as a church family, you've provided us with a way to carry on meeting you. And it, is, it is beyond just the, uh, the, the things about physicality and geography, Lord God. Even though those things are important, Lord God, we thank you that we still get to connect with you. We still get to commune with you through your spirit, Lord God. And so in the same spirit, Lord God, we pray for us right now that as we look into your word, as we listen to Jesus' calming voice right now, may he give us peace, may he give us hope, may he give us challenging conviction for today, for the rest of this week, for the whole of lockdown and for all the days ahead. Speak to us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So Brad's going to be finishing up your series uh, on James, I know you guys have been doing that for a while now, and so today I've been allowed to share um, some thoughts on something else. And I wanted to really look at what's happening in our lives uh, right now, now that we are over a month into this lockdown that we're experiencing in the UK. Like so, as I said, we're all getting into a rhythm and starting to get used to how we work and live under these conditions. But I think it's also starting to wear some of us down, especially those of us who are living with perhaps big families and need that space we're used to having a bit more of a kind of a time to be away or with different, different people. Um, there's kind of those dynamics there that we've lost, or perhaps you do live alone like I do, and we're starting to feel that lack of having some, some like good times of meeting friends and having meals with other people, and all of that's been lost in this time. And a few days ago, uh, I found this article uh, on the BBC um, reporting how different artists um, have been exploring what lockdown means to them right now. And right at the top of that article on BBC is actually the photo that you can see uh, on the screen right now. It's a sculpture made um, by the artist Sir Anthony Gormley. Uh, he's actually so happens to be the same guy who did um, the Angel of the North, uh, that big sculpture that some of you guys may know um, up north. And he calls this piece Hold, H-O-L-D, Hold. And Gormley says of it, I wanted to make this self-contained body looking at itself at the resources, at the resource that one has within oneself. A whole body, a bit like a clenched fist, internal and attending to within. I suppose that for me, I was trying to make an objective equivalent for the state that we're all in. Most of us live, in, most, most of us live our lives in ridiculous obligation to a machine that is always telling us to do more, have more, go to more places, make more money. And this is a wonderful time in which those imperatives are loosened and we have to ask ourselves, what do we care about? What do we value? What do we love? So Gormley, he, he presents this piece, this kind of like reaction of what his soul is feeling like and what it's trying to do in response to the lockdown situation. And I think he's quite right in that many of us right now are trying to reevaluate what our priorities are. But did you also, also notice that at the top of that quote, that his aim of this piece was to show how we're all right now having to look inwards for resources. We're having to turn ourselves inwards and look at where do I find my stability and what reserves do I have whilst we're under lockdown? I think he's ultimately asking this question, how do we remain resilient during this time of incredible disruption to our lives? And that, for me, that's a great expression to go on whilst we're all being forced to evaluate our sources of security in life, what does Jesus have to say about how we find those internal resources? 
So let me read um, our text today. Uh, I'll be taking it from uh, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 9, and we're reading from verses 14 to 17. Um, I'll be reading from the ESV, and it might be different from the version that's on the screen. doesn't matter. It's pretty close. Um, and here, Jeff, Jesus is questioned um, about this practice of fasting. Um, so let me read it for us. Uh, so Matthew, chapter 9, verses 14 to 17. If you do have a Bible, maybe open it and follow along with us. It reads this. Then the disciples of John came to him, that's Jesus, saying, why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. No one puts a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch tears away from the garment and a worse tear is made. Neither is new wine put into old wineskins. If it is, the skin bursts and the wine is spilled and the skins are destroyed. But new wine is put into fresh wineskins. And so both are preserved. And just kind of help pace us. There are three things I want to help us uh, to highlight to us as we listen to Jesus teaching us here how we are to properly understand fasting. And I think there's ways to understand how that might help us in this period of lockdown. So three things. The first, we need to recognize our hunger. Second, we must redirect our appetites. And third, we can feed on Christ's abundance. We need to recognize our hunger. We need to redirect our appetites and we can feast on Christ's abundance. So first thing. We need to recognize our hunger. So in this scene, uh, Jesus is confronted about a matter of what a truly spiritual life looks like here. And John's disciples here, they're essentially asking him, why do your disciples not observe this kind of weekly fast, this ritual fasting that we do and all the Pharisees do as well? When we all understand that fasting is the way that you show your devotion and your love and your worship to God, why, why do we do it? And why do you not do it? Why do you not keep up with this way that we understand we've got to do to stay connected with God? And the people challenging Jesus here have this kind of like transactional understanding of what fasting is. They understand it as something you did when you wanted to show your desire for God and to deprive yourself of food in order to make you more holy and therefore amplify your prayers to God. So by not eating, they thought that they would become more acceptable to God and would be able to become closer to him. Now that's what's so startling when Jesus says this, well, there's no need for my disciples to fast. Why? Well, because I'm here, because I'm God and because I'm God and I'm here with them. I'm already as close to my disciples as they can get to me. So why would they need to fast? Instead, they should be celebrating with them whilst I'm here with them right now. There's no need for them to have to earn their way into my presence by fasting. So when Jesus tells John's disciples that they can put new wine, they can't, sorry, they can't put new wine into old wineskins. What he's trying to say to John's disciples is that they need to realize that the very thing they're looking for is actually right in front of them. Because they started off seeking God through fasting, but over time, their rituals, their practice, they, it's, it's turned into religion instead and kind of a transactional ritual. They don't even recognize anymore that the thing they're actually looking for, the chance to celebrate and be present with God, is right there in front of them. Now, in many ways, I think what we're going through right now under lockdown is actually a kind of fasting. It might not be food that we're fasting from that we're being deprived of right now, although it probably is a fast from things like decadent food and, and restaurants and all, because all the restaurants are shut and we're having to cook for ourselves. So the level of food that you're eating is really dependent on how much attention you were paying to in the take when you were growing up. So it might not be food that we're fasting from, from, but we certainly are fasting from lots of other things. If you're a student, then right now, 
you're being deprived of learning. If you're living with a family right now, then you may be feeling a lack of, of times of solitude. If you've stopped going to work right now, then you're being deprived of perhaps income or you're being deprived of a chance to be creative and productive with your energies. And even for us as a church right now, as different churches in different places, we're being deprived of this chance to meet together in the same places, to sing with each other, to pray with each other, to talk to each other in ways that are close and genuine and present with each other. But for me, it raises this question, like, how do we react when these kind of disruptions come? When we're deprived of the things that make life happen normally, things like school, family, work, creativity, productivity, Sunday services, when all the things that we normally do to bring balance in our lives emotionally, intellectually, financially, when all those things are taken away from us, how do we react? And I think there's basically two responses when that kind of disruption happens. You either surrender those natural desires that we have for those things. And so by surrendering, accepting them, you start to rely less on those resources or you work harder at it, you overcompensate, you find new ways to achieve it so that you generate enough of that resource to fulfill those desires and to meet them and to satisfy them. As an easy example, if you run out of food, you either accept that you're going hungry and so you don't need to go out and buy any more food, or the flip side is you take it from someone else to feed yourself. You either surrender or you overcompensate. You either accept or you try harder. And I think we saw some of this in the early panic buying um, and the way that people were perhaps like going out to, to beaches and on like these long hikes uh, early on into this lockdown. I, I think that was a great example of, of this kind of thing was people realized that their lives were being disrupted at the time. And so they compensated, they tried harder by buying enough supplies or buying more, than, more supplies than they thought that they might need to make themselves feel secure. Or they were going out more to make themselves feel emotionally therapized now that their freedoms were being suspended. Because without an internal source of security, these were always going to be the natural responses of people. Without that internal reservoir of abundance, of natural energy and life, people were, you can't really blame them, they were always going to try and find those ways of finding ways of fulfilling those desires and those needs from elsewhere. And right now, as many of us are having to socially distance ourselves, we also are in danger of either working too hard to accept our fate and deny our needs for socializing, productivity and the freedom to move. Or, and perhaps more likely, we're overcompensating and we're working extra hard to achieve those things by having I don't know, 10 Zoom calls a day and tiring ourselves out. Either way, we forget to see what we really want. And that's to be at peace with ourselves and be content with life. And we're trying instead to achieve those things on our own energy, on our own effort. But like Gormley, uh, the artist earlier on, like he says, we need to first become aware of what it is that we're actually looking for in life. What's our priority and what are the things that we take joy in? So the first question for us is, what is your hunger right now during lockdown? What do you miss the most about what we'll call normal life? And can you recognize the small ways where you've tried to react by either telling yourself you don't need it anymore or you need less of it? Or have you tried to overcompensate in trying to achieve it and to get it? So firstly, we need to recognize our hunger. And secondly, we must redirect our appetites. You see, I think what Jesus does in this, in this passage here, in this teaching he gives to John's disciples is that he changes the way that we see fasting. Even when that fasting, that period of fasting is forced upon us. Now, although uh, in verse 15, it seems like Jesus is saying that the being a disciple is going to be a life of like stoic discipline and fasting and deprivation. It, it sounds very like 
holy and monastic in a lifestyle. That's why it looks like, but, but I think actually what Jesus is doing is that he's veiling the fact that fasting isn't meant to be a practice of difficulty, but it's actually meant to be a practice of nourishment instead. The old garments, the old wineskin that Jesus is talking about, that, that thing that he uses to analogize fasting in the traditional or in, in the way that the, the John's disciples were trying to use it, it, it's basically a way that's religious and it's trying to earn God's attention. But the new cloth, the new wine, there are ways to understand how we can use those times of fasting to be times instead of renewal and nourishment from God, rather than times where we desperately try to make him hear us and listen to us. Why? Because we know that he's already near to us. And you see, that's what Jesus means that he says that this is new wine. And for the disciples, this is going to be a new way of understanding what fasting actually is. He says that the disciples will fast after Jesus is taken physically away from them. But when they fast after that, it won't be in the old way of depriving themselves in order to amplify their devotion. It's not going to be a way of earning Jesus' attention. But instead, it's going to be a way of enjoying Jesus' attention and ministry. So again, for the disciples, for Jesus' disciples, this won't, fasting is not going to be any more a way of earning Jesus' attention. It's going to be a way of enjoying and being present in Jesus' attention. It's going to be a way of pointing your whole being for them. It's going to be a way of allowing themselves to feed on Jesus and be reminded that you don't only live on food, but also from spiritually feeding on Christ. And what Jesus is saying is that although one day he's going to leave the disciples physically, but his spirit will remain with them. And that's how they'll continue to celebrate in his presence. But in order to enter into and stay within that party, they would need at that point to regularly fast and redirect their spiritual appetites back towards him. So for us today, when we're deprived of what we would normally use to, to feed our souls and to fill those voids, the, to fill those spaces of emptiness and hunger in our lives, it's actually right now a chance to retrain our hearts to feed on Christ instead, relying on him for sustenance and nourishment for our souls. And the beauty of it is that you neither have to deny your needs for peace and joy, and comfort through that nor do you have to work at overcompensating and generating those things through substituting them but instead you can maintain those desires those things that we naturally hunger for you can keep them at their levels but you can also find the very source of their satisfaction in christ himself rather than having to deny them or find them in other places by not relying on perhaps good food, close friends, or a successful career to provide security and contentment, and instead relying on Jesus himself to provide those very things. This is a time for us to retrain our hearts to seek its source from him instead. Because as good as those things are, they are never certain, as we're kind of experiencing right now. But Jesus himself, in his spirit, is constantly with us, is constantly present, and we can always, always find that he is reliable in being near us. And so if you're responding to, to, to this lockdown period by perhaps passing uh, all of your time on, on games or learning recipes or socializing using these alternate uh, online platforms that we're, that we're doing, those things are great. Those things are good ways for us to maintain a sense of life and society. But I think this is also a really good chance for us to redirect our appetites from those things away from just simply being distractions. I think a lot of the ways that we're kind of reacting right now, in some sense that the proverbial snack whilst we're waiting for this lockdown to be lifted and then we can eat of those things once again. But if you can recalibrate and if you can approach this time 
instead and see it as a time of fasting, actively seeing this as a time of fasting, then you can start to train yourself to neither deny your desires for the things you love, nor distract yourself with a snack. But you can see this as a way to train and redirect your appetite for, the thing, for those things to be fed on the ultimate source of those things. Um, there's a, uh, a scholar at King's College, his name's Tim Willard, um, and he quotes, so it'll be on the screen for you. Uh, he says this, in fasting, a person might, must fight through the appetite to remain focused on the act of pursuing God and loving others. And what he means says he's, this is about working hard to achieve or to earn those things, even through like Christian service. In fasting, a person must fight for the appetite to remain focused on the act of pursuing God and loving others. If a person can push through these hunger pains, they discover that they're just fine on the other side of them. Pushing past that threshold of desire requires discipline and trust. It requires a person committed to eating God at that moment and relying on only him as sustenance. Um, the theologian John Piper puts it, puts it this way, and he encourages us to see fasting like this. We fast not because you haven't tasted the new wine of Christ's presence, but because you have tasted it. And you long with a deep, joyful aching of soul to know more of his presence and power in our midst. Today, as we encounter lockdown, the better question isn't whether we should be doing less or more with our time, because both of those responses are still about relying on yourself for your security. This is about recalibrating your connection with God again and to let him feed you. So recognize your hunger, redirect your appetite, and then finally feast on Christ's abundance. And here I think is where the, the wonderful nuance about um, this way that Jesus is teaching us about how fasting can be a truly spiritual experience. Because when you learn to treat this time of lockdown right now as an active fast, one that neither des denies your desire nor substitutes the source of fulfilling that desire with something less, but simply utilizes this time to endure them, to push through them by approaching God instead it starts to have or will have a profound effect on your enjoyment of those very things when you finally get to enjoy them again. And I think also it will change the very depth and meaning of your faith too and how much of your soul's appetite and your faith relies on God. Around four years ago, um, there's this missionary couple uh, from America who were missionaries in Turkey, and they were there for 23 years. Their names are Andrew and Noreen Brunson. Um, and uh, about, I think it was about four years ago, um, Andrew and Noreen, they were both imprisoned um, by, uh, by the government of Turkey um, after they were accused of being spies following um, a military coup that happened in the country. Um, and Noreen was uh, released, um, his, Noreen was Andrew's wife, she was released a few days after being um, put in prison, but Andrew ended up being put in prison and falsely accused of being called a spy for two whole years um, before uh, the American government finally made a deal um, with the Turkish government to get him released. And what has happened was that he was, he was I mean, he was accused, but it was, it was just on some really uh, weird grounds and weird observations but they wanted but the, the Turkish government they, they held they held this guy they held Andrew just because they needed some leverage over a certain things so it was basically being held unjustly and after um being released uh in a kind of uh, uh a time when um the, the American had made that deal um he realized that he was kind of fasting whilst in prison from having any kind of justice being done in his life. And because of that, like afterwards, uh, he, he did a few interviews. And one of the things that he said about his time whilst being in prison um, was like this. I held fast to the promise that God will make all things right in the end. 
that doesn't mean thirsting for vengeance. It just means that while Jesus is portrayed as a lamb, pure, innocent, sacrificial, he is also portrayed as a fierce lion. And someday those who persecute my brothers and sisters are going to encounter Jesus. And then when he reflects then on his time, those two years in prison, he says about this, about his, his own self. And he says, I miss being so completely dependent on God. Extreme circumstances are sometimes necessary to push us towards God. Without them, our natural inclination is to decline in faithfulness. And we have to be deliberate about cultivating it. Sometimes I'll find myself praying, Lord, I'm not hungry for you, but I really want to be. And he said that after he was released from prison, after his freedoms and his life and his mobility and his ability to just enjoy uh, things like his family and life and travel and, and all those things. He's, he's, after he's got access to those things again, he reflects back on his time under prison, under his own kind of lockdown, when he was denied justice and freedom. And he says, I miss being so completely dependent on God. I think for us, during this time of lockdown, it's a really, really good opportunity for us to spend time with God. Maybe on the, uh, the time that we would normally be commuting home from work, it, it might be instead of time for us to go on a, a prayerful walk. Maybe in between um, our games or our books, we can just read one chapter of um, the Bible. But whatever it is, it's about taking the things that we've lost and instead feeding on those regular things through God every day instead. The reason why all this is possible, the reason why Jesus can reshape what fasting can mean for his disciples and for us as his disciples now is because Christ's gospel is the promise that in Jesus Christ, you can find the ultimate source of that joy and that life-giving thing. Because the gospel tells us that in our hunger, Jesus himself invites us into his wedding feast. Or in times when we feel isolated and alone, we look back at the cross and we see that that's where Jesus allowed himself to be isolated, to be left alone, even by all his disciples and even his father at that point. Why? So that we could become members and join in with God's big family. And where for us right now, for our community, our country, for the world right now, death and disease is threatening our very lives and our livelihoods. Jesus promises us that his resurrection is a way for us to enjoy hope in his eternal life. One that will be free from sickness, free from pain, free from suffering. When we look back at all the things that we've lost during this time of lockdown, we can then look at Jesus and find that he is the true source of all the things that we truly hunger for in our life. We can only imagine what it must have been like for Andrew to have been isolated for two years from his family and having his name falsely shamed. But by feeding on God during that time, he found the satisfaction that he couldn't even recapture even after his freedoms had been restored. Now, if you're doing well through lockdown, then great, you probably don't need this. But for those of us right now who are feeling that nagging feeling that something isn't quite right inside of us right now, we can learn in this time to neither repress our desires nor to substitute our desires during this time for whatever it is that we've lost and instead feed that desire on Jesus instead. And when we do, the wonderful thing is that the next time we get to experience that thing that we've lost, it'll make it all the more delicious, all the more beautiful and all the more life-giving because we'll know where that thing draws its true value from. When this lockdown ends and you get to simply enjoy things like eating at a restaurant, hugging your friends or taking a holiday somewhere or even going to the shopping or going to the theatre, whatever it is that you take great pleasure in, this period will be a way of profoundly elevating your enjoyment of that thing. But it will also be a way of profoundly changing the way that you relate to God too. So that even though when things go back to normal, 
you won't need to rely on those things as much anymore because you found your supply in Jesus. So wherever you are and whatever you're doing for the, the days and weeks ahead, I pray that you learn to take time every day to eat God, to feed on Jesus. And those rarer things you lost will be satisfied by him. Let's pray together. Father God, in this time, many of us have lost access to the things we've loved. We've lost routines. We've lost enjoyment. We've lost um, goodness and life-giving activity in our lives, Lord God. Father, our lives have been changed so much, but we thank you that just like you, how you've given us technology to still be able to meet in some sense spiritually, we thank you that it is really your spirit that draws us close to you. It is not by our effort in coming to you is the fact that you sent your Holy Spirit to be with us. And so help us, Lord God, to recognize that there's a Holy Spirit that is really the source of all things. You created the world, so you really are the source of everything that can give us life and goodness and energy. And so in the days ahead, we pray that you train us, you help us to refocus our desires and our appetites for the things that we truly need in our lives back towards you. Help us to neither struggle through this lockdown by denying ourselves nor struggle through it by trying to work extra hard to feed ourselves, but instead help us to accept, to remember and to realize that you are the true source of our life and our soul's nourishment. And so help us each day to feed on you. Help us during this time of lockdown, to stay strong spiritually in our souls by meeting with you every day. Help us in that journey. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, uh, Josh, for the, uh, just the, the, the reminder and the encouragement. So everyone, that uh, that concludes our service uh, for today. Uh, just a reminder again, next Sunday we will be uh, taking communion, so do have something ready to represent the bread and the cup. So go in peace. See you next week. <laughs>